Happy Father's Day! Proverbs 22 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. God calls fathers to train their children in the way that they should go, and it's not easy. Children are all different. They have their own wills, and many times they are not willing to be obedient, even if you try to bribe them. That's why it's so important to pray for for our fathers, not just for today, but consistently. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, our Abba Father, the ministry of fathers is such an important ministry in the family. It's not easy, but you have called them to such a role. Please help us, Lord. Give us wisdom and patience and love that only could come from you. Lord, we lift up to you our birthday celebrants this week. Victoria Rose Shepherd, thank you, Lord God, for another year in her young life. Help, Lord, to grow, to trust you and love you and serve you. Give Rosie and John wisdom to help Victoria in the way that she should go so that she would keep your word in her heart and live for you. Lord, we also lift it to our other birthday celebrants, Luz and Solomon. Thank you so much for their love and support to FACC. You know, Lord God, that they have been such a, a big part in the FACC history. Lord, help them, Lord, to be a light as they love and live for you. Love people and live for you. Help them both physically and especially spiritually, Lord. Help them always to seek you. Help them, Lord, to look not into this world for wisdom, but from you. Thank you, O Lord, in just name, Amen. Happy Father's Day, FACC Church family. Uh, today, we celebrate our fathers for all the things that they have done for us. Uh, so as we celebrate them today, I want to take a look at the definition of what it is to be a father. 
A father is defined as a man in relation to his child or children. That relationship is given by God by means of a man being the biological father of a child, or it's given through the legal system by a man being the adoptive father of the child. Now, in both examples, the common characteristic is that the relationship of a man, that, that man, he becomes fully responsible for the life and care of that child. Now, being a father in its purest sense is expressed by how the father provides, protects, teaches, disciplines, and warns his children. Now, as Christians, we also recognize the men who are spiritual fathers to us, whose godly example of obedience and actions, teaching and spiritual nurturing result in the birth or care of the children of God. So today's passage in Genesis 4, we get insight into the early generations of fathers. Before I read the main passage, I want to give you the setting. We're starting in the beginning in, in Genesis, the story of creation. God created everything, and it was good. But when he created man, he saw everything that he made and, and he, he finished that, and, and, and he, he said, it was very good. From the beginning, God the Father of all valued his children above all creation. And not uncommon for children, Adam and Eve disobeyed, and their consequence was that they were, they were cast out of the Garden of Eden. They go on to have two sons, Cain and Abel, who grew up and gave their offerings to the Lord. God was pleased with Abel's offering, and he had no regard for Cain's. And out of jealousy, Cain kills Abel. And the, the Lord punishes him by saying in Genesis 4.12, When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on earth. Now, rather than repenting for just killing his brother, Cain complains about the severity of his punishment, but God promises him that if anyone kills him, then the Lord will take vengeance upon them, set upon them sevenfold. And God puts a mark on Cain to let people know not to kill him. These were the first two, two generations of humanity beginning with Adam and Eve. So the implication is that the rest of humanity still had a relationship with God the Father. So now we are going to jump into our passage here in Genesis 4, verses 17 to 26. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city. He called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Eran, and Eran begot Mahujiel, and Mahujiel begot Methushael, and Methushael begot Lamech. Then Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the second was Zillah. And Adam bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who played the harp and flute. And as for Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal-Cain was Nama. Then Lamech said to his wife, Ada and Zillah, he'll hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me. 
even a young man, for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. As for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Years ago, when I used to read passages like this with genealogy, I would skim through it like this person begot this one and this begot this and so on and so forth. And it wasn't until these past few years that I would really slow down to try to understand the scripture and not just skim through it. So today we're going to do that. We're going to take a closer look uh, at um, what the scripture is really trying to tell us. So we just got looked at all these generations of fathers. But the first father, God, God is our heavenly father. Up to this point in Genesis, the first father, our heavenly father, he mercifully gives Adam and Eve a way to escape eternal separation when he removed them from the Garden of Eden. Jesus later teaches us to pray to God the Father when he taught us the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven. Now the first father, the first man, is Adam. When his son fears that he would be killed for killing Abel, I could, I could rightly understand how he would imagine such an outcome. Now, the only people mentioned at this point in Scripture thus far is Adam and Eve. Other sources say that there are other people around, but let's take the Scripture for what it is in front of us. Adam's family was the first family. And when a person is in, the fa in, the, in relationship of a family, one finds protection. And it's logical to see how Cain would fear for his life, for the sin that he committed from both Adam and Eve, but especially Adam. I, being a father, could, can relate to that, that wanting to protect my family. But God, God the Father, our Heavenly Father, being merciful, he didn't wish for Cain to perish, but he gave him a punishment. But Cain doesn't accept it. Now, rather than being a fugitive or a vagabond, Cain removed himself from God's presence. He went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, east of Eden. In Hebrew, Nod means wandering. Or vagrancy. But Cain, he, he chooses to end his relationship with God. He chooses to stray from what God had told him. He chooses not to accept the punishment of wandering, and he chooses to build a city, a city that he names after his son Enoch. In this action, he is saying, I will not listen to God. I will not be a vagabond. I make my own stability. And the glory goes to my creation. His desire, his motive, his focus is towards self. Four generations of descendants in the line of Cain quickly fly by in this passage with no mention of anything that they did. And it's not until the fifth generation after Cain where the scripture reports anything. Here we see Lamech, the son of Methusael. He gets deeper into sin and moves further away from God. There are two significant things that Lamech does that I want to highlight and compare. Now let's start with addressing the two wives. 
God created the institution of marriage between one man and one woman in Genesis 2.24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now with Lamech, he is speaking to his two wives. So here we see the first occurrence of polygamy in the Bible. This action of having two wives by Lamech cheapens the institution of marriage that was given by God. In this account, it's interesting that no wives are named until the wives of Lamech. We, we, if you look at the genealogy, no, wife, no wives are named. Also, another notable thing is no other women are named. W women are named in this account, except Nama, the daughter of Lamech. Next, we have two murders. The first murder in the Bible was when Cain murdered Abel. And we saw talk about people wanting to kill Ain, but God, being merciful, prevented it. After the murder, Cain was the first in his lineage to stop following God. And generations later, we see Lamech boasting about this double murder. He killed one man for wounding him, and a second, a young man, for hurting him. It looks like he's bragging to his wives about this. The words he, he used to describe how he avenged himself for being wrong are very self-centered. I have killed a, a man for wounding me. Even a young man for wounding me. In the lineage of Cain, you see, you can see the descendants drift further and further away from God. How do we see this? Five generations after Cain, Lamech knew what God said about avenging Cain sevenfold if someone killed him, if someone killed Cain. In Genesis 4.24, he says, If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. This promise to avenge did not originate from God. Rather, Lamech essentially twisted God's original statement for his own purpose. Recognize the pattern of his actions. You see, Lamech altering the institution of marriage for his own purpose. You see him avenging himself when killing the two men rather than letting God avenge the action. He's essentially putting himself in the place of God. Lastly, you see him declaring how he will be avenged 77-fold, twisting the things that God says. Now I want to compare the and contrast the um, the lineage of Adam and Seth versus the lineage of Cain. In the line of Adam and Seth, we see that they walked with God. We see obedience. Our Heavenly Father gives us warnings. God warned Adam in Genesis 2, Verses 16 and 17, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. God warned Cain in Genesis 4, 7, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Adam and Cain didn't heed the warning, and there was a consequence. God later goes on to warn Noah, Noah in the lineage of Seth. He warns him that he is going to flood the earth. 
but Noah being faithful. He heeds his warning. Yes, that day is approaching as the signs are seen by believers and not believers alike. There is an uneasiness about the world. We are living in times where many of the things created by God are being redefined by the world. FACC family, fathers, don't ignore the warning signs. Jesus says in Matthew 24, verses 37 to 44, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and would not, al- would not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. FACC Church family, we are all children of our Heavenly Father. And I want to leave you with these few points. Apart from God, we are eternally lost. And no earthly successes can restore that connection to our Father. It's only through our faith in His Son Jesus that we are saved. Second, families that have a relationship with God and an intergenerational connection are an important aspect of making a difference in the world. Without that connection to God, there is no difference. Lastly, we should choose to walk in obedience and heed the warnings from God because our decisions not only have an impact on us, but they have a potential impact on our descendants. Now imagine, imagine this scene. The family is gathering at the table for a feast. But one of the family members takes his food and sits outside. While another is off doing something else and completely misses the meal. Yet another who has already eaten fast food, only wants a small taste of the bountiful feast that's prepared before them. This list can go on and on about why the family does not gather together to feast on the meal. When we gather as a church family, we gather to give thanks to our Heavenly Father. We gather to feast on the Word of God that is there to nourish and grow us. So as a church family, Hebrew Hebrew 10 says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching. Pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here at FACC. I thank you for the warmth that comes from the family of God. I thank you today on this special day. I thank you for all the grandfathers and the fathers, Lord, who lead their families 
Bless them as they lead their families. Let them walk with you and hear your voice so that they can honor you and give you glory in everything that they do. Give them the word to speak life into their families. Give them silence and stillness when they need to come before you, Lord. Gracious and merciful Father, I thank you and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen.